Hello and welcome to Get the Table. I'm Michael Sidgwick, joined by Benjamin Richardson and Michael Hamflick to discuss another burning wrestling issue. But before we get into it, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure to subscribe to Wackle Wrestling on either iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from for daily wrestling podcasts. We preview and review Raw, SmackDown, the Wednesday Night War, pay-per-views, we hold wrestler interviews, roundtable discussions like this, and a roundup of the week complete with a bloody good quiz, of course, on wrestle culture. Thank you so much, Adam Wilborn. I'm just ripping off your cadence, and I'm getting paid money to do it. Thank you very much. Now, the question, virtually the only question on any wrestling fan's lips in this tedious <laughs> run-up to Christmas, where everyone just wants to get Christmas enjoyed and or over with, depending on your disposition, <laughs> is what on earth is going on with AEW's Dark Order? It's been quite the furore. So to kick us off, what did you think of the closing segment of last week's Dynamite? I thought it was peculiar, and I, I thought it was just not the right way to end 2019 for what's what been an excellent uh, few debut months for Dynamite. It just le left a sort of sour taste in the mouth. Um, but, and, and also, it's, it's created this vacuum of two weeks of where all we can discuss is what was this about, which mm. is what we're doing now. So yeah, I, I, I didn't think it was necessarily the worst thing I've ever seen in the history of professional wrestling, but it was completely flat. Uh, it didn't really serve any particular purpose at, in the moment. I think they've got plans for it involving Hammond Page, obviously. Um, the crowd were dead for it. I said, yeah, I just it just seems like a one of an increasing number, unfortunately, of missteps that the company are making lately. Yes, I tend to agree. I think the Ferrari has been quite overstated, but Michael Hamflit, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most wrestle crap, how wrestle crap was this for you? Hashtag join Dark Order, about a seven and a half, <laughs> I would say. It's, I think it suffered more from timing. I think, as Benjamin points out, the last visual of AEW's year, especially in contrast to the first visuals of the year at that glorious press conference where they were launching, where they said they were going to change the universe, the implication being that they were going to change how WWE does wrestling. And then they end the year with probably the most WWE segment yet. Like I think you highlighted that the fingers down the throat thing was a direct riff yep. on one of mm. WWE's lowest ebbs of this year. So there was even like things that you could compare to it there. Um, yeah, wrestle crap is that term that, you know, ultimately we kind of have a bit of an affection for those things. Yes. And at the moment, this is the reverse of that. People have got affection for almost everything in all elite wrestling. And yet this is one of those few things to turn even the purists and, the, you know, I would say yourself included in that into more, I don't know, to feel more worrying as we go into 2020. And I don't think... I don't think that would have been on anyone's agenda for AEW that there would be things to be concerned about so soon. And, mm -hmm. and the big difference as well is that wrestle crap is generally quite funny and something we look back on with nostalgia, whereas this felt like an intrusion into something that we're already enjoying mm. and sort of like it's, it's, it's toxified a product that was fine to begin with. It wasn't necessary in any way. Mm. I'm intent to agree. It's just the whole optics of it. As Hamflet alluded to, I tweeted not too long ago um, a four-picture tweet, the first of which was the image, uh, almost iconic in the worst possible way, of Seth Rollins having been throat banged by the fiend and blood had been drawn from his mouth. Now, in the wake of that Hell in a Cell main event, both Chris Jericho and Matt Jackson directly... I wouldn't say they criticized, but they very much subtweeted about it. Um, Chris Jericho just did a mind-blown emoji. And Matt Jackson, in a very cheeky nod of promotion, was, oh, by the way, Dynamite is back next Wednesday, as if to say this show that we're doing, Dynamite, is directly antithetical to yep. this rubbish we're seeing. And then on last week's closing image of Dynamite was literally almost the exact same thing. A supernatural or supernatural adjacent character plunging his fingers down his throat and thus drawing blood. I think... And Seth Rollins lasted longer than Matt Jackson on Twitter. I know. You know, like, just to really tie all this up. I know. I think the... I'm inclined to think that if this angle took place in the middle of the show, away from the glare of this big... Yeah closing image maybe it wouldn't have been received as poorly but i think the optics of it ultimately have made it look like if this is their version of a main event then kind of god help them going into 2020 because it just looks and i'm a fan of the dark order in premise which i'll get onto later but to me it just looks like silly pro wrestling on that note can they rescue this and this is not me doing a Willborn because it's WWE, not WWE, so it can't actually be rescued. Can they rescue or otherwise salvage or make it look less silly with a simple cosmetic change in aesthetic? Well, there are a few things. I mean, one thing AW has proven to be excellent at so far is correcting the times when they veer off course. They're very good at that. Um, they've got a few things in the favor. One is that we know when they come back in January, they're going to reset all the win-loss records. So they might sort of 
use it as a chance to maybe reboot, not reboot for sure, it's a bit ridiculous at this stage, but, you know, just freshen things up and maybe just put this to bed. It'll be in a couple of weeks. I can say this, you know, just pretend it didn't happen and just redip them looking maybe a little. I think the gimmick fundamentally can work, but it, at the moment it looks very amateurish. Mm. And I think the Dark Order, as you mentioned, the work of the actual team itself is is fine and excellent in places. But ever since Dynamite's kicked off, there's been something of like the Bet Noir product, sort of a carbuncle every week that just doesn't seem to fit mm. with this elite presentation. And a lot of that is just, it is cosmetic. So yeah, maybe maybe even just a change of attire, a change of outfit, just something that makes it look more, you know, professional. Preeminent gear expert, Michael <laughs> Hamflit, who loves wrestling attire more than his family. I'm Correct. very keen to have your opinion on this. What does it look like to you? Does it look low rent? Does it look like the sort of act that could possibly work in this context, looking at it cosmetically? I feel like it looked worse than it did. It looks all right by comparison to how it first looked, but the improvement hasn't been stark enough, which is in contrast to the vignettes, which completely overhauled like how this storyline looked <laughs> to begin with. It made me feel, to be honest, like seeing them all come out in those, like the, the all black gear was, you know, it, I wouldn't say it was like low rent exactly, but it still felt like cheaper than the rest of All Elite. Well, that's precisely it. It just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to correspond or correlate with the rest of the product that you're watching. They've all, like All Elite Wrestling has tried really hard to walk that tightrope between retaining like the cool factor of indie wrestling, but capture some of WWE's quality production so that if you're flicking the channels, you realize you're watching a high level wrestling show. Mm. And that veered way too far in the direction of indie wrestling. If you were going to go to an indie show and have like 10 geeks run out of masks, mm. you'd be more than acceptant of that kind of look. And but I think they've told people with their staging and their pyro and the, the chandelier to, to want more and to ask for more. And if and if you are comfortable with an indie aesthetic, why not just let the Dark Order be the Super Smash Brothers? Well, I'm not right. Yeah, the, yeah but you could change the name, you could still do that mm. gimmick. This is quite a, a different turn for those two characters. And Evil Uno, even though he was this big guy in a mask as part of the Super Smash Bros., it's still a very different him that you're seeing coming out on Dynamite. Is it the, the thing for me? I'd like, I don't know. I've, we talked about this when we were reviewing this episode of Dynamite for another podcast. What struck me was that we'd all been like quite enthusiastic about those vignettes. Mm. And then sometimes you think, like, how much are we in the bubble that we thought they were fantastic and the Dark Order were completely saved? And as you say, AEW had shown probably the biggest course correction of the year to fix the dark order. And then as soon as they're back in front of a live crowd, it's like, oh, we fixed absolutely nothing mm. because that would have been where you would have now, got the reaction. That we're glad to see these back. And it wasn't there. Obviously the angle didn't receive the reaction services, but a, a, a silly hypothetical question, but would we be having the same discussion if that audience had responded? Would we still be saying it was terrible? Obviously we wouldn't be, but a different audience could have reacted differently on a different day. That's the thing. This all it's is the content game, isn't it? Yeah. It's the criticism game. It's the critic game. It's we could get made a fool of because next I'll, week on I'll January first when it all goes right. It's possibly not, it's not as though the angle was getting booed, and some of the baby faces, Kenny Omega in particular, did get a reaction when he met, came in to make the save. So it wasn't a complete tragedy. It's just how hot the show is and has yeah. been. It's just the contrast. Now, for me, just before I touch on to the next point, the problem I have with the attire is that it doesn't look like attire. It looks like they're all wearing costumes. Mm -hmm. They've all been yeah. backstage. You know what I would prefer to see genuinely is if what I like about the uh, act is that it's kind of been tethered now into reality with the idea that they're all kind of incels on a computer, disaffected, angry with the world. I would just like to see them come out in a mask if one thing, because they're kind of shamed and want to hide themselves, much like incels hide themselves on the most toxic corners of the internet. Why not have them come out in masks? That's one thing to sort of bring the whole aesthetic together, just in jeans and a t-shirt. And more specifically, and this could be like foreshadowing a future rivalry or whatever, old Bullet Club, or elite t-shirts to make it look like they are just disaffected fans and they've been pulled to the dark side by the dark order. The masks, Not it's panto. The masks already exist in like protest culture, and you'll forgive me for forgetting the exact you know the it's face. The, anonymous. It's the Guido Fox, yeah. Yeah, the Guido Fox one, yeah. They're like so that. clever. He's the cleverest guy in the office, this one. Apparently. <laughs> Thank God for that. Because I was like thinking of that, like the antithesis of that would be that troll face, wouldn't it? You know that one that yes. we like, did around a couple of years ago. Something more resembling that than a wrestling mask, not least a jobber wrestling mask. This is the mask that WWE used to put on guys and call them the executioners in the 80s yeah. mm. if they needed to, like, goobers to get them beaten up. And that's what we've seen instead of, as you say, something that remotely resembles maybe the real-life idea that we're all familiar with. Like, if the, the Dark Order went along with the monsters under the bed, but the monsters on Twitter and Facebook, that's something that we can probably all identify with in fear, but we're not actually being shown that once the, we see the physical manifestation of those brilliant vignettes. And, and oddly as well, e Evil Uno wears the mask despite being the leader a man who shouldn't be anonymous. It should be his charisma that encourages people to join. 
Oh, and it's part that. of the gimmick. He looks the, like, currently in the suit, he looks like an ample Excalibur. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite guy in the Dark Order is that fella, that like Steve Jobs type fella in the clouds <laughs> from the first week. And it's almost better the longer we don't see him on television um, because he feels like the preeminent threat. Like, dare I use these words in a wrestling context? He feels like the greater power. And like, oh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to think eventually someone comes out for the Dark Order to pull the hood off and reveal themselves like Vince McMahon. But it still feels to me like this angle is in need of a leader of his magnitude or ideally someone that we care more about, you know, in a wrestling context, like, like, more so than Eva Luna. Like Don Callis. I've got a Jim Koresh of wrestling. I've got a fantasy booking scenario I'd like to lay in front of your feet here. Now, my whole problem with the Dark Order is potentially it hasn't been clearly defined which might be a problem in itself it feels like it's almost supernatural which i think is yeah. quite incongruous to this world i think part of the reason why those vignettes in addition to giving us a reason to care or a bit of backstory seem to hit tentatively as they did is that it tethered the whole thing to reality now what i would like to see is aew the books specifically in a promo because we generally don't get enough of them from the elite like we really don't i would like to see the books acknowledge the idea that the dark order are in fact the super smash brothers um a bit of a backstory on the super smash brothers to um develop this theory a little bit further they were in pwg particularly around the mid early to midpoint of the decade like really making waves as a tag team and they were part of that generation with the books adam cole kyle o'reilly who were really breaking through and who basically comprise all of AEW and NXT right now, they were like very much marred by visa issues, which prevented them developing their profile in America. And for years, they experienced a prolonged period in the um, wilderness. Now, for me, because it's real and therefore isn't cartoonish and can potentially connect, I feel like they should draw on that backstory and use it as the motivation for the Super Smash Brothers becoming the Dark Order. Would something like that go some way to helping people think, right, okay, I can actually sink my teeth into this? Yes, because to this point, I don't really understand what the Dark Order's objective is. Yes. It's winning wrestling matches ostensibly, so why do they need people in masks? Why do they need initiates? I don't... I don't know why I should care. This the, the two fellas who came in the Beaver Brothers of the Beaver Boys, whatever you want to call them, um, Alex Reynolds and John Silver, it feels like a step back for them. They could have been wrestlers in AEW <laughs> without masks, and now they've had to embarrass themselves in a main event segment and get masks put on them. What's the point? To counteract that, one of the things I like about the Dark Order, and I don't, th I think certain accusation accusations of it just being this supernatural odd thing that's clumsily welded to AEW. I think this act like fits into the holistic wins and losses matter philosophy in that there's a consequence and a gravity to wins and losses in AEW. The Beaver Boys, obviously, as enhancement talents, have just been there to lose to Proud and Powerful, I think they put over. I like yeah. the idea that people lose, they feel like losers. And now the initiators even bigger losers. But the idea <laughs> is the Dark Order is meant to make them feel less like losers yeah. by joining an ostensibly winning act. I like the idea that it fits somehow Can into I the philosophy, but it's not connected. On that subject, though, would you feel le uh, more important if you're one of many pawns? I Don't you work hard to get to the other side? If you're weak enough to begin with, which is who they're preying on, if you felt less than like nothing then that's kind of who they can pick up. They're not going to pick up people in society that are halfway there and want to get to the top. No, but I'm saying, I'm saying line, in terms of, of the Beaver bros. Boys. Boys. Boys, Jim Ross. Yep. <laughs> for, for Beaver Brooks. For, um, shouldn't they be trying to, if they're pawns currently, why don't they try hard until they get to the other side of the, of the, of the board and become queens? I know you're being a little bit facetious. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely. I'm th I do think that potentially they could have really like hammered home the idea that these guys are complete losers. Like, we've seen them once on TV. Yeah. Maybe twice. I'm thinking once, and I've seen every episode twice at least. I don't think maybe they've developed their motivation to join yet outside of one squash loss in a vignette. Maybe it's rushed. Is that the problem? Well, it's, it is rushed, yeah. Is it there is a wider rushed. issue here, though, that AEW are trying something that just this year alone WWE have failed to do, which is yet again make sort of spooky, weird stuff work? Can supernatural stuff work in 2019? Like, we've seen um, the amount of times... You, know, you, skipped yeah. the, you skipped ahead. <laughs> just to make a <laughs> Some broader point. Just, 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 uh, just one more thing to interrupt there, Michael, just on, on the Beaver the Beaver Boys point. One, two, three kid in 1993. If he loses one week, does he then next week join a loser cult because he knows he can't possibly make it? No, he keeps he comes back week after week with a different name until he beats Fraser Ramon. Counter, counter to your counter, the one, two, three kid worked so well because we've been <laughs> bludgeoned with the idea established yes. for decades that those guys just didn't win. 
But we, we, but as wrestling fans, we know that as well. If that's sort of implicit to people who are watching AEW, I'm glad this turned into Sean Walton podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. like, what got me thinking with the Dark Order getting no reaction was how like the diminished returns from the Fiend, from how excited we all felt in you know like WWE saving this character, a previous spooky failure in Bray Wyatt to reheat it to then watch it burn all over again. I think which that... which was also really effective in the vignettes until it became like physically manifested. Obviously, the SummerSlam thing was fine, but yeah. after that, it was sort of uh... is the discerning wrestling audience of which AEW have catered to whilst trying to expand their operations simply not in the mood for this type of act anymore, no matter how you frame it. I, I believe, however, that wrestling fans will submit to the story because that's the best way to enjoy a wrestling show. But is this like one leap too far? Would it not have been clever? If you look at the inner circle by comparison, a heel stable that dominated and beat up the elite, they went over fantastic because Chris Jericho all gave them a reason to be. That's not happened with the Dark Order, mm -hmm. but at least like in the interim stages of that stable coming together, we all knew the motivations of them. I guess what you touched upon, the ultimate question is... If done well, which the Dark Order hasn't been so far by my own shill admission, <laughs> say, for example, they get it absolutely perfectly right with this supernatural gimmick. Is the fact that it's a supernatural gimmick in itself just completely prohibitive to this getting over? Um, not necessarily. I don't think it's anathema to all wrestling fans' tastes. If it's good enough, it'll get over. Look, Lucha Underground is popular for many years with you had know, dragons and you had supernatural beings, you had demons, you had people dying. It's perfectly fine. It just has to be well told. It's like any work of fiction. Nobody doesn't watch, you know, you just, people just went on mass to see Star Wars, which is about people with shiny sticks hitting each other. That's fine. People people, people get very invested in that. Been delightfully reductive on this podcast, Benjamin. Well, that's where you have to be. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I get it. I do completely get it. Yeah, you have to compare things fairly. And, and, and it's if, if something's not working, it's because it's probably because it's not good enough. Otherwise, it would get the reaction. Worse, like, Silly, let's say sillier things in the Dark Order have got be better reactions. Orange Cassidy being reductive is a silly thing, but he gets great reactions. I think he's a key difference. I think a Joey Ryan or an Orange Cassidy, that's <laughs> more in like in line with where wrestling is from a postmodern point of view. Yes, I mean, versus, there's a, there's a, there's a hint of irony to, to both those acts, whereas the Dark Order was being asked to take up face value. But the same thing, I'd say the same with The Fiend, to some extent, where I've been asked to take up face value, and people bought into that initially. The guy missing Dustin Rhodes by a foot on that video that well, we've all seen on Twitter. Well, he's excellently, hasn't he? Well, but you know what? Such is wrestling these days that he would get over on a Joey Janela spring break as a guy yep. that just can't hit somebody Precisely. in the face. That's how that gets over now, versus how he looks currently on an episode of Dynamite in a mask. So just wrestling can't, like wrestling fans can invest in something as because, silly as that. Because he's so useless and you can't even punch someone who's like literally underneath and frosted. Does he, does he now get kicked out the Dark Order? Does he move up a rank in the Dark Order? <laughs> <laughs> Presumably it's a race to the bottom in that faction. <laughs> Evil Zero. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So yeah, but then us reducing it to mock it, like you're saying, Benjamin being reductive and us mocking it, that doesn't bode well for this stage. Oh, that's because, the thing. Because AEW has been drenched in optimism since the very beginning mm. because A, there's no history to say they're going to get it wrong, but B, people want things to go right. And that felt like a narrative shift, like to use their word. That was a paradigm shift last mm. week, wasn't it? This but whole I, angle. Sorry, look, we're talking about irony. I just, what about the Jurassic Express? I mean... The thing about the Jurassic Express... That is tongue-in-cheek, but it's it's not just flared for laughs. It's distinct from me because he can actually take Luchasaurus seriously because he's gigantic and yeah. his stuff is genuinely awesome in the and actual definition of the word. There's an offbeat charm to that act that's hard to articulate, that simply works. Charm is not a word I would describe to use the dark no, order. No, but I think there's something really crucial and simple there as well, and, and I just think it's purely aesthetics. Like, Luchasaurus looks class. <laughs> that's just... <laughs> I mean, I get the idea that there's a sort of a blanket thing. Oh, there's aliens and dinosaurs, and they're getting over. The dinosaurs is one thing. I can't believe I'm using these words to describe <laughs> AEW. The I real really sports feel. The thing about Chris Statlander, the alien, I think the curve helps her enormously. She's obviously an incredible talent with potential to get more incredible. But I think a lot of the reaction with her is, well, she's an alien, and it's kind of a bit weird and crap, but she's also awesome and... She's awesome relative to the division. Yeah. She's escaping criticism for the most part because of that. Jurassic Express just work simply. That for me, Dark Order need something intangible to their act to really get people connected. I to know them. a bit of your take on this because I know we've discussed this over the desk. Like, are the Dark Order already in trouble? Because in AEW, it's already feeling like there's an element of repetition with both the Nightmare Collective and Butcher and the Blade. Because I know they're not exact perfect comparisons. 
but there does seem to be a little bit of an issue there with their like sort of fall back fucking tricks. The thing about the butcher and the blade for me, it just happens to be some bad guys who wear black. I refute that argument. I will say, however, that there's three ongoing recruitment storylines with the Inner Circle, Nightmare Collective, and mm. the Dark Order. And I think the optics of that make it look like, oh, is this company out of ideas? Or is it breathing the idea that a booking committee possibly isn't working out and there should be way more synergy to the product? Does that sort of synergy conversation lend itself to the idea of, oh, it could just become like a more regulated brand devoid of expression? Should theoretically the Dark Order be allowed to go out on the sword or should there be more control and less regulation and you get more grim comparisons to WWE? I mean, I suppose another way they could go with that is that they try and create a New Japan concept where you've got some wrestlers that are linked to AEW and then the rest are tied to one stable or another. I'm not suggesting the inner circle becomes 10 deep or something. Yes. That would negate the point of that stable. But fundamentally, everybody is tied to one group or another or you read the team AEW. Maybe that's a long-term philosophy they've got because they've seen how successful it is in like New Japan being able to protect their undercards, for example. AEW Dynamite, eventually is going to run out of those brand new combinations mm. we haven't seen. It's going to need these banger tag matches every single week. So it wouldn't half help if guys are just tied to stories. If you've got like two Dark Order guys that aren't complete losers mm. that can fight Kenny Omega and Hangman Page and it look like a ticket selling match, mm. then it's advantageous for them at least to have these numbers to use. They're not there now mm. and it's probably a long time away, but maybe that's a long-term game with a story with a stable like this. On that note, do you think pro wrestling, good pro wrestling can save this act and make it look somehow congruous? Like if they can just flat out go. Can I take a more rational viewpoint on this? Of course you can. We talk about saving the act. We've been criticized in the dark order since they turned up in AW. In fact, since they turned up before that. Um, the wrestling, the actual wrestling's good. I think they've had a, ter a, a bad segment this past week. On the whole, when it's been just midway through the shows, it's just been something that you think, oh, it's a Dark Order segment, so what? It's okay. It's gone. I think I'm prepared just to let it breathe for a little bit, see where it goes, see what happens. Just don't put it in the main events. Don't use it as a way to, to, to create tension amongst the elite. Do that some other way, like with your established top line guys. Mm -hmm. um, My problem now is, I know it was just one episode and this could be considered a hyperbolic reactionary podcast, but the second they drew Kenny Omega into the mix got me worried and sort of warranted yeah. the criticism. And I think there's been conversations about Hangman Page potentially joining. This for me illustrates and underscores the idea that, oh, this can't work because the second I see Hangman Page in one of those masks, I'm just thinking, nope. Like it just, it feels like one act has the potential to drag down another whereas that same act doesn't have the potential to elevate anybody else. We see that generally for the future, it's not very good when talent come in at the top as well. It was a fundamental flaw of the NXT call-up system, wasn't it? You were never more over than you were on your first night when you went over an established mm. star and people popped for your appearance, and then it was the only way it was down. Well, Polar opposite to how guys used to be introduced. Well, it's interesting you say that because that's that, that's the opposite of how AEW's um, VPs have tried to put themselves, with mm. the exception mm. of Cody. Um, the Young Bucks have took loss after loss after loss. They don't, didn't win the tag title. Don't. Kenny Omega's purposely took a backward step because he wants to reheat himself organically where, uh, next year. You know, um, Hammond Page, obviously, he's not at the top yet. But they are looking to get everybody over to them and put themselves at the forefront of television. But unfortunately, they're coming from a place like effectively NXT where we all see them as the stars. Mm. So it's unpalatable to see them, you know, losing yeah. or getting beat up by people like the Dark Order. Yeah, my worry is, particularly with the Dark Order and how it seems to be affecting the Omega page dynamic and the fact that the Young Bucks have suffered losses. And it's obviously going to lead to a fire I Young mean, Bucks versus Dark Order match, the likes of which have been seen in Smash Wrestling. Go and see it if you're as scared <laughs> as I am. It's fantastic. You, you could also take a step back and just try and consider it another bump in the road to fill up some television time as it prolongs a feud to the next pay-per-view. It feels like an overarching thing that yeah. it doesn't need to be. And I'll tell you one thing before we sign off that I think hasn't helped this cause whatsoever, that I think has been a little bit lost in this sort of hot take conversation. I don't necessarily think this would be such a big controversy as it is, at least as, you know, a pre- podcast Christmas thing can potentially <laughs> elevate it as such. A niche within a niche within a niche. Indeed. Um, I think this wouldn't be talked about anywhere near as much if something like Chris Jericho versus John Moxley was on fire and it isn't and it should be. And I think if that was as on fire as Cody versus Jericho was, this would be considered a little bit of experimentation that perhaps shouldn't warrant so much criticism. History suggests you're right. Whenever the top angle's hot, everyone else is more over as a result, aren't they? You know that. And certainly AEW last month, if you think about the 
the Cody and Jericho promo, uh, uh, promos yeah. heading into full gear. That product overall couldn't be any hotter, and nobody can recall anything they disliked from that show. At the and, time. And, and yeah, it's worth noting it wasn't actually perfect. Yeah, of course it wasn't. Part, no, yeah. they were still experimenting. The women's division hasn't yet yep. got to a point where mm-hmm. it should be. So there's th- there's never been yet a perfect dynamite, and yet now. As you say, the go home for full gear was perfect. Yeah, I would agree. Zero downs, I got that. <laughs> zero downs. I put on the website, but but yeah, like so, the point we're at now, where one or two bad things, you know, kind of like making people question the the future of the product, mm. and yet the things on top that should be hitting aren't. I think it's just it's not worrying times for AEW, nor is it particularly worrying times for the Dark Order, because if they are booking, you know, with a twelve month view in mm. mind, they'll see this ending long before any of us. But I just, I suppose they're. It's really, really hard, just like it was to recapture Buzz. It's really, really hard to like change a narrative. Mm. And AW aren't just AW for the first time swimming against the tide. And some of that is to do with the Dark Order. And they've got to think very carefully about how to try and arrest that before it becomes too big for them to overcome. Indeed. Right. Um, just one more question yes. before we go. Uh, would you like to see Ryback in a Dark Order match? No. Or Mask? No. Okay. <laughs> it's a possibility now, apparently. <laughs> simply, <laughs> simply not. Now, before we do the sign-off, usual sign-off. less, Benjamin. Yes, before we do the usual sign-off, quick one-word answer. So months down the line, when we've got a firmly established answer, we can go back and say, oh, we were right on that. Or we can just completely ignore this podcast altogether. Will the Dark Order get over? Yes or no? Yes. 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 And I think that speaks to how well AEW have done so far. But any more answers to the contrary and you feel like they're possibly in a little bit of trouble. It's hard not to be optimistic about them at this stage. Mm, Indeed, you'd hope so anyway. Right, well, what do you think of the Dark Order? You can sign off in the comments below. I think a bulb might have just popped. You can also get us on Twitter. (laughs) Another lights out match from (laughs) me. (laughs) <laughs> where can people follow you on Twitter uh, can follow me at beat it at uh, three put it for so desire what about you Hamflit? at Michael Hamflit, if you really want you can follow me and you should I'm good on Twitter <laughs> at M Sidgwick you can follow us all at What Culture WWE do not forget to subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from and we will see you soon have a cracking Christmas yes <laughs> Merry Christmas <laughs>